Hello, this is William from Visual Components, and I'm going to show you how to attach objects to the path of a conveyor. For example, boxes, push trays, and sleds. This is helpful if you want your conveyors to already have equipment on them when you start a simulation, or to customize a conveyor for a specific solution. For example, you may want a conveyor to have different types of trays or boxes on them. Before you get started, make sure you are using Visual Components Professional or Premium, because you will need access to the component authoring tools, which you can find here in the Modeling tab. To get started, clear the 3D world of all components. I'll now go to the eCatalog panel, expand models by type, click Conveyors New, and I'll add the first conveyor here to the 3D world. Let's now attach a box to the conveyor and move along its path. In my eCatalog panel, I'll click Products and Containers, do a search for a box, I'll add my good friend here, the red plastic box, to the 3D world. And notice what we're doing. We are not adding a feeder to create components during a simulation. We're using a static component. So when I run the simulation and reset it, notice the box is still there. It's not disappearing. Let's now move the box onto the top of our conveyor. I'll use the snap command and snap it to the top face center here. Let's now attach the box to the conveyor. Go to the hierarchy group and click Attach. And I'll now point at the conveyor. So we're attaching the box to this node in the conveyor. We get feedback from this blue arrow that the box is attached to the conveyor. And if I select and move the conveyor, you can see the box moves with it. So this box is a child component of this conveyor. I'll press the Control and Z key to reset that movement. So now our conveyor is back at the 3D world origin. And if I run the simulation, you can see that the box is not moving in the conveyor's path. What we need to do is create a Python script in the conveyor that grabs the box onto the conveyor's path. Might sound like a lot, or you're not familiar with Python, but I promise you it's only four lines of code. Let's reset, select our conveyor, go to the modeling tab. I'll now add a Python script, so go to the behaviors drop down menu here and click Python script. This automatically opens the editor of the script, so let's move it next to the component graph panel because this is the data in the component that we are working with in our script. I'll press the control and plus key, or plus sign, several times to make the text bigger. We don't need the on signal event, so I will select it and delete it. But we do need the on run event because this is executed at the start of a simulation. Make sure you have the right indentation. And let's start by getting the component that is containing our Python script. I'll create a variable called comp equals get component. So this variable of comp is referencing this component, our conveyor. Let's now get a variable that references the path in our conveyor. I'll write path equals comp. I'm using the component object to get a behavior that has a specific name. So what is the name of the path in our conveyor? You can see it here, it's called path underscore underscore hide underscore underscore. Path underscore underscore hide underscore underscore. Now that we have the path, let's find what is attached to our conveyor. So I'll say box equals, I'll use the component object, which gives me access to this property called child components. And you'll notice we get some information here from the IntelliSense that it gets us a list of components that are attached to the node that has this property. So our conveyor has one root node right now, and that's what the box is attached to. But since it's a list, we only want the first item, so the first box that's attached. So I'll use an index here of zero. From there, we want our path to grab the box. So we'll say path.grab. And this allows you to grab a component onto the path. What do we want to grab? Well, we want to grab our box, which is referenced in this variable here. Compile the code and make sure you check your output panel for any errors or messages. Everything looks fine, so let's move this out of the way. Clear our selection so we can see everything. And run the simulation, and yeah boy! Notice the box is now moving on the conveyor's path, and once it leaves the path, it disappears because we want to save memory, so we do a garbage collection of removing it. But remember, that box is a static component. When I reset the simulation, the box is back there. And that's it. You can see that by using four lines of code, we were able to attach a box to the conveyor and move it along the path. But we're not done yet. Let's actually add more boxes. 
I'll go back to my home tab. We don't need access to the script right now, so I will exit out of it. Select the box, and let's move it closer to the start of the conveyor to give more room for another box. I'll use my Move tool, and let's just drag along the x-axis. I'll use these tick marks here to go to 350 in the world coordinate system. So right about here is fine. I'll now click the box, and then from the mini toolbar, I'll use this command called clone, which quickly copies and pastes the component. And here's the second box. And let's now move it to be on top of the conveyor. So start dragging the y-axis, and now you can use a shortcut by holding down the shift key. And you can snap the box along that axis by picking geometry. So you can pick the geometry of these rails, side rails in the conveyor, along its belt here, but also the face center. So right there is fine. If you get lost trying to use this command, it's OK. Just select the box, use the snap command again, snap it to the face center, and then drag it along the x-axis, say, to about 1100. That's fine. Now, if we run the simulation, you can see only one box moves. Well, what do you think we need to do? Hopefully you know we need to attach this box to the conveyor. Use the attach command and attach to the conveyor. Now, since this was the last component attached to our conveyor, it's probably at the first of the list. So if we run the simulation, yep, this original box here is not the item that we were grabbing. So if we reset, select our conveyor, go back to the modeling tab and access our Python script that we added. Let's make it a bit bigger. You can see that we're only getting one box. So how can we grab multiple boxes? Well, we have to create a loop. So instead of using box, let's use boxes. And instead of getting the first item in the list, let's get the entire list of components that are attached to our conveyor, which we know are these two boxes. And then we'll create a for loop. So for box in our list of boxes, use a colon. And then just indent our line here so that it's inside our for loop. So every time we get a box, we're going to grab it to the path. Compile the code clear selection so we can see the boxes, run the simulation, and yeah, now we got both boxes moving on the conveyor. And when we reset, remember, they're both static components, so they're back on the conveyor. And remember, they are attached to it, so when I move the conveyor, they move with it. Let's now get a bit more crazy and copy and paste this conveyor. So if I select a conveyor and clone it, look what happens. Whenever you copy and paste a component, you are copying and pasting components that are attached to it as well. So notice we have a brand new conveyor with its own set of boxes. But it also copied the behaviors in the original component. So it does have that script for grabbing these boxes, which you can see by running the simulation. Let's now reset and try to create a loop that the boxes can flow from one end of the conveyor back to this end. I'll go to my eCatalog panel and click Conveyors New. Let's now find this component called Curve Conveyor. Drag it into the 3D world. And let's connect the Curve Conveyor to this end of our line, right there. But we want about a half circle for our curve. So in the conveyor angle, let's change it from 90 to be 180. And instead of playing it safe, let's actually select both of these conveyors. So select one, hold down the Control key, click the other one to add it to the selection. You could use the clone command, but you can also press the Control and C key and the Control and V key to quickly copy and paste them. We're still using the PMP command, so we can drag our selection of new conveyors and just move the interface at this end close to our curve conveyor. We get feedback, and eventually they snap together. Let's now copy and paste this curve conveyor and move it to the other end here. And we want to attach this end of the curve conveyor to receive boxes that are flowing out this direction. So just move this interface close to the end here. We get feedback, so drag in that direction. Green means good, they're connected, and the same thing happened here. So once again, just unplug them and plug and play. Run the simulation, and show me that loop. Yeah, there we go. So let's just verify that the boxes will flow in one loop so we can speed up our simulation a bit. 
So that's one loop. And we got another loop. That's good. What do you think we can do next? Well, we got these two curve conveyors that don't have any boxes. So let's actually put boxes on them. An easy way to do this is to run the simulation, wait till the boxes are on this curve conveyor here, and then copy it because the boxes will be attached to the curve conveyor while they're moving on it. I'll go to a top-down view. I'll click the top button here on the view selector again to just rotate the camera around so I can get this view here. And now for the simulation, I want to wait until the boxes are on the curve conveyor without any trailing or leading edges sticking out of it. So I'm going to slow down my simulation just a bit. And I believe it's around 15 seconds that we need to stop the simulation. So Wait till all four are on the curve conveyor, right about there. So yep, so they're right on. There is a bit, you know, leading edge here, but that's fine. So just select the curve conveyor and copy and paste or clone it. And remember when you clone a component or copy and paste it, you're copying and pasting components that are attached to it. So remember, these boxes, when they move on the curve conveyor, they are attached to it. And that's why we have a brand new curve conveyor with its own set of boxes. And when we reset, notice that the boxes are static, which is why they weren't removed. So now it's just a matter of switching out these curve conveyors. So I'll delete this curve conveyor, select this curve conveyor, and plug it into my conveyor loop. Boom, there we go. Let's do the same thing for this curve conveyor, but let's actually see what happens if we run the simulation. Oh, same thing as before, you notice that we didn't actually grab the boxes onto the curve conveyor. They are attached to it, but we didn't have that logic there, that Python script. So select one of the conveyors that has the script in it, for example this conveyor here. Go to the modeling tab, and let's get that Python script we added, so I'll open that editor. I'll select all the code and copy it. I'll then select the curve conveyor here, so I'll just double click it and then add a Python script to it. And let's move our editor over here to the component graph panel so you can see the data. Remember that we're adding the Python script to the curve conveyor to grab boxes that are on it. So let's select all the code. And just paste in the new code. Make sure you're referencing the behavior that has the right name. So path underscore underscore hide underscore underscore that is the name of the path in the curve conveyor here so we're fine compile the code check for any errors there's none close it out and now what we could do since this curve conveyor now has that logic we can delete this conveyor here and copy and paste this conveyor and then connect it to the other end of our loop. So right there. Yep. So remember we're looking for those green arrows. And now if we want, what we could do is also change the geometry of these two conveyors. So we could select both of them and then change its presets to be, uh, let's say, a twin belt. It's a bit too wide for the box right now, you can see. So we actually could make this a multi-belt. Run the simulation, and yep, so now we have a loop of conveyors. So let's reset, and notice the boxes stay put. But instead of using boxes, you could of course use other components. So what we could do is create a push tray that moves along the conveyor. So let's actually select one of the boxes, don't need access to this Python script anymore, so let's close it out. Go to our cell graph panel, and because we're using the same type of box, you know, it has the same category, we have this long list of components, so just click the category to select all of the components in it. We now have all the boxes selected, so let's delete them. Let's go back to our e-catalog panel, and let's create a brand new component, so I'll use a basic shape, in this case a block, drag it into the 3D world. And like we did before, let's move the block on top of the conveyor. So I will snap it there to the face center. Let's now change its dimensions. I think it needs to have a different height, let's say 10. 
we don't want the tray to be too big. <laughs> and for its length, I think 400 is fine, but the width, you can see there's gaps here, so let's make it 500, which is the width of the conveyor. And yep, that looks fine. Let's now give this component a new link or node that can move in this direction to push apart. So I'll go to the modeling tab, create a new link. You can see right now the link is here, but we want to push from this direction going forward. So let's just snap our link offset to this midpoint of this edge here. So it's right here. And how did we get there? Well, you can see in the offset that we translated up along the z-axis first, so the height of our tray or our block. And then the next translation is along the y-axis to go over here. But let's also rotate along the z-axis 90 degrees. So our x-axis of our link or node is going in this direction. And you can see that here in our offset for the link. So an expression is read right to left. So first we're rotating and then we're translating along the Z and the Y. So I think I want to be at 90, but this is fine. We can clean this up a bit. So let's rotate negative 90, actually. And then we can get rid of these trailing zeros for the translation along the Z axis. Remember that each function is separated by a full stop or period in the expression. And we can get rid of these trailing zeros, too. Let's also make our link have a joint so it can move, so let's make it translational. We get feedback here that the joint right now will move along the z-axis. We don't want that. We want to push in this direction. So let's make it the positive z-axis, which is what we have showing here. These larger coordinate axes are showing the active coordinate system right now, which is the world. So if we change it to object, you can see now it's pointing in this direction. For our joint, let's give it some geometry so we can visualize how it would push something. Let's go to our features, drop the menu here, and add a block. Notice the block is added to our link or new node in the component, and it inherits its offsets. So that's why the block is here. Let's change its length to be, oh, I think length actually is going in this direction along the x-axis. So if we make it 500, yeah, it's going this way. So let's change this to be 50 then width will be in this direction here, so let's make this 500. But you can see that's a bit too long and it's not at the right location that we want, so let's actually align it to be at this corner point here. You could snap it here to the corner point, but you can also drag the y-axis, move it along the tick marks to kind of line it up, but you can hold on the shift key and you can snap to specific geometry. In this case I'll change my render mode to face edges shaded so I can better see where that midpoint is, or that, that corner point, sorry. So drag the y-axis, and I'll try to pick this edge here. Didn't quite do it yet, so let's, there we go. So in the object core system, I believe that was negative 200. But once again, you can move it away and just snap it there, like this, okay? Remember, it's too wide, so with the feature selected, let's change its width to be, I think it's 400. Yeah, there we go. Let's also change its material so we can better see it. Let's make it, uh, how about pink? Pink matte. And clear our selection, and yep, there we go. And now if we interact with the joint by pointing at the geometry that's in it, or the link, notice that we can now drag it in this direction. But the Minimum and maximum limits for our joint is not the best, so let's reset to return the link to its initial value. I'll double click the feature here to select its link or node. If we go to the link properties panel, you can see its initial value was zero, so when we reset, it returned the joint to zero. For its min limit, let's make this zero. And because the width of our conveyor is 500, this has a width right now of 50, or length, so 500 minus 50 is 450. Interact with the joint again, and yep, we can push in this direction. So push out here, it resets the joint to its initial value of zero, which you can see here. Let's now control this joint with a servo. So for the joint in our link, let's click the drop-down menu here called Add New Servo Controller. And to quickly make this use signals and inputs, let's go to the extra group here and use a wizard. 
So with a wizard, you can quickly create an I.O. control here, as long as your joints have a servo controller assigned to them and you have your kinematic structure set up. So I'll click the wizard. Let's make it a bit bigger here, this task pane. So this is the joint that was assigned to the servo. That's responsible for moving this component, this part of the component here. So let's reset it. Go back to our wizard. You can see that we have two options for closing and opening the joint or moving it to its minimum and maximum values. So hover over the field here, you can get some feedback that When the value is closed, it's driven when the signal value is true. In our case, we want these flipped because if we open the joint, it's going to drive it when the signal is false. So we want to go to 450 when the signal is true. So let's just change these values here. And the reason I did that is you can see in the tooltips that when the value is closed, it's when the signal it gets is true. So I'll click Apply, close out the wizard. And if we go to our component, go to its behaviors, you can see we have the servo controller that is controlling the joint for our pusher here. We have a script that was created by our wizard that uses these three signals. So the action signal is what you need to trigger to start moving the joint. These two signals here just indicate if the joint is open or in a closed state. You can rename them if you need to, just remember to rename them in the script here. Now let's see how this works. So if we go to the connect signals command, let's select our push tray here. You can see it has boolean signals, an action signal, a closed state, open state. The action signal is the signal you need to pass a true or false value. So when it's true, we're going to move it to its maximum value. When it's false, it will move to its minimum value, which is here. An easy way to simulate that is to run the simulation. And as long as you have the Enable Signal Toggling option selected here in the Connect Signals task pane, you actually can toggle this signal here, the action signal, to true or false. So when I click it, it gets the true value and the servo drives the joint to its max value and we get feedback that it is now closed. We can now toggle it again to be false and now the servo is driving it to its minimum value and we can see it's now in an open state. So how can we trigger this when the tray passes through some type of sensor. For example, it gets to some bin and it needs to push a part off the conveyor line. Let's see how we can do that. So let's reset, close out of the connect signals command. And what do you think we need to do? Well, we first need to attach our new component to the conveyor. So let's select the block component. You probably want to rename it, just call it push tray, and then save it as a new component. In my case, I'll just keep on with the video. I now want to attach this component to the conveyor, so I'll go back to the Home tab, use the Attach command, and we're attaching it to the conveyor here. So now if I run this simulation, you can see my push tray is now moving along the conveyor line, and it should loop around. Let's now create a sensor here that will detect our push tray and signal the pushing in this direction and resetting it. So I'll go to my e-catalog panel, go to processors, let's add a conveyor sensor to the 3D world, and then plug and play the sensor to this conveyor here. Notice the sensor is also attached to the conveyor, so I can drag it to a different distance along the conveyor's path. And when the sensor is triggered, it's doing nothing, but what we could do is signal after some time lag to the tray. So as soon as the part is detected, you could wait a couple seconds before you start pushing. And that might be helpful if you know the pusher has to start pushing before it even reaches the location it needs to send a part to. So for our signal after time lag, let's use a time lag of, say, 0.01 seconds. And now we need to connect the signal to our push tray here. So let's go back to our connect signals command. Notice our sensor has these four signals, so we want to use our time lag signal and wire it to the action signal we're using to push apart. So let's now just wire it to our action signal. And now they're connected. And if we run the simulation, we get this issue. <laughs> you 
you can see that in our script we were attaching anything that is attached to the conveyor. So in our case, the sensor was attached to the conveyor here, so it, you know it's moving too. So we want to avoid that. Let's reset. Close out of the connect signals command. And how can we fix this? Well, these sensors have a special interface that allows you to connect them to the conveyor's path. So we can use that information to eliminate components that are connected to this interface. So select the conveyor here that has the sensor. Go to the modeling tab. And let's expand its behaviors and open that Python script that is what we're using to grab boxes. Since this conveyor doesn't have any boxes right now, what do we want to do? Well, we could grab anything, for example, a push tray, but we don't want sensors. So let's get a list of sensors equals. In our case, we need the interface in our conveyor that is connected to the sensor. So we don't get confused. Let's drag the editor over here to our component graph panel and see what data we're working with. So we have these behaviors. We have the path. We have an in interface, out interface. This is connecting the conveyor to other conveyors. But then we have this sensor interface, and that's what we need for our script. So let's type sensor interface equals, use the component object again to get a behavior by a specific name. In our case, we know that it's called sensor interface. From there, we can get the sensors a list of components that are attached to this interface. So sensor interface. I believe it's connected components that we're looking for. Let's check our Python API real quick. So I'll go to help tab here, access the Python API reference, and an interface is a VC sim interface, which is this type here. And yep, we're looking for this connected component. So it's a list of components that are attached or connected to the interface. And that's what we have here, good. So now for our boxes, we don't want those to include just a, you know every component that is attached to our conveyor. So what we can do is modify this list a bit and say we want C for C in that list of child components if C is not in our list of sensors. We, of course, need to call this after we get the sensor, the components that are connected to the interface. Otherwise, this will give us an error. So we'll just cut it and add it here. Make sure it has the right indentation. And then when we go to grab a boxes, it will not include the sensors that are attached to our conveyor. So once again, we get the component. You can see it here. We get the path that's in the component, which is here. We get the interface that allows us to connect sensors to the conveyor, which is the interface here. We then use that interface to know what components are attached to it or connected to it, which is what we're getting here. We're then checking the conveyor to see if it has any components attached to it, for example, a box or a push tray. But we're also eliminating sensors that are connected to the conveyor from that list. And then we're grabbing the boxes or could be any item that is not a sensor currently connected to this interface. So if we compile the code, we didn't get any errors, so let's move our script out of the way. And now, if we run the simulation, you can see our sensor is staying put because in our code here, we eliminated it, we excluded it from our list of what we're grabbing to the component's path, the conveyor's path. So here comes our push tray. Let's see what happens when the sensor detects the part and sends the signal. Yay! <laughs> looking good, looking good. Okay, so from this point forward, we could go on and kind of make a workshop where we figure out how to push a part into a slider or another you know, bin that's over here. But we'll probably save it for another video. But as always, if you have any other questions, please feel free to use our forum at forum.visualcomponents.com. And I will include two layouts for this video that you can use for your own reference and developing your own projects.